Hi everyone, my name is Katie Shabak and I am an alumni of Freedom High School. Currently I attend Kent State University where I'm finishing the first year of my master's program. So my project is centered around the Eastern Red Cedar, which is a juniper tree that you've probably seen in your backyards or along roads and things like that. So first I wanna talk about the distribution of the species. So the Eastern Red Cedar is native to the Eastern portion of the United States, meaning that it's naturally found and it was not brought in from another location. But this species has been greatly expanding its range in the past 50 years. So this species has moved south into the southern states and Florida, and it's also moved across the Great Plains and moved towards the western portion of the country. So it's greatly expanding the location that it naturally occurs in, and it's also changing the types of ecosystems that it's found in. So typically this juniper tree is found in forests like the ones that you and I grew up in um, in Western PA, but now it's kind of starting to shift its environment from this forest to a grassland or prairie ecosystem. Let's take a look at how the encroachment or the expansion of the species into prairies happens. So at the very beginning, you have these prairie or grassland habitats that have very little tree species, lots and lots of grasses, what you want in a healthy grassland or prairie ecosystem. And then we have all of these little trees kind of start to dot the landscape. You see them every once in a while, but still lots of sunlight reaching the ground. So you have lots of grasses still. But then finally, you get what looks like this, and there are lots and lots of eastern red cedars clustered together, so this decreases the biodiversity of these areas, so these trees prevent other species from growing below them because they're sucking up all that sunlight. Humans play a really important role in the dispersal of this species, so it's used as an ornamental plant along houses and gardens, it's planted along fence rows and roadsides, it's also used as a windbreak around different houses and buildings. Before we can start talking about the true dispersal of the eastern red cedar, we ha have to take a look at the life cycle. So this species is dioecious, which is just a fancy word meaning that there are male trees and female trees. So our male trees will produce the cones that you see at the top, and the female cones will produce these teeny little structures at the bottom. So inside the male cones, there's pollen, and as the wind blows, the pollen is carried on the wind to find female cones. It fertilizes them and produces these beautiful blue berries that you see here. After the berries are produced in September, they stay on the tree until March, and that gives mammals and birds the opportunity to consume these berries. So these berries aren't extremely nutritious. They're in the same family that gin is made with and so these berries are typically a last resort for animals in the winter months as all other food is kind of eaten and consumed and this is what they have left so they eat the berries they poop them out and then the seeds are able to germinate to grow into these adult trees so my project focuses on this berry stage so as the berries are on the tree the birds and the mammals will come and eat them, and so their digestive tract will get rid of that fleshy blue outer covering until you're left with the picture on the left where you just have the bare seed. And so that seed can now germinate wherever the bird drops it in its feces, hopefully away from that parent tree that the berry came from. So this is how the Eastern Red Cedar is able to disperse its seeds. It uses birds and mammals to do so. We divided our dispersers into three groups. The first is the resident feeder, so these organisms don't travel very far. They kind of stay in their natural habitats. They also feed alone. This also includes all of the mammal species that we can observe in my project. Next are the nomadic feeders, so these organisms follow resources as they change. They feed in large flocks, so this means that they'll descend upon an area or a group of trees and just kind of strip them of all of the berries and then move on to the next place to feed. Next are the migratory feeders. So these organisms follow a set migration route throughout the year, and they also feed in large flocks as well. The wood thrush is a migratory species, and this map shows its migration route throughout the year. So it travels from this pink area, and it migrates in the yellow area down to this blue area in Mexico and Latin America. And so this organism has the potential to disperse seeds 
if it consumes seeds in this pink area and then as it travels it can pass the seeds. So it shows how seeds can be moved from place to place. As of now I have three main hypotheses for my project. Um, so the first one is that functional feeding group, which are those three groups we just talked about, will influence seed dispersal based on the distance travel and feeding group size. So that's the one we're going to be mainly talking about today, but I also have one based on seed removal rate. So how fast are those little berries plucked from the trees as they're on the trees from September to March? And then I also have a hypothesis based on the different feeding groups and how they contribute to long distance dispersal. So like I said, we're only going to talk about this first one here. So we base these hypotheses on what we call dispersal factors. So we base them on feeding group size, which is dependent if the animal feeds alone or in these giant groups like we talked about earlier, and then potential dispersal distance. So we were thinking that since our resident species don't travel a lot, they're kind of depositing the seeds in that same area. But our migratory and nomadic feeders, as they move, uh, follow the resources, or migrate, they have a greater distance that they could disperse those seeds. As of now, I have two field sites, one by Sandusky, the Lakeside Daisy Nature Preserve, and one at the south of the state. Uh, it's called Kamama Prairie. I'm hoping to add a third towards Columbus called Prairie Oaks Metro Park. I'm very fortunate that I have permits for all of my sites and that they're all very undisturbed by humans. So they're really strict in who they let in, and so I can observe the foraging without human interference. So the birds aren't being spooked by lots of people hiking through an area. So at each of my sites, I've chosen five female trees that have these blueberries on them, and then each of my trees has two cameras. So the tree camera at the very top you can see there focuses on branches with berries. So this looks at which species are removing the berries from the branches. And then my ground camera is focused on the ground as the berries fall from the tree to the ground as organisms either pass by or are foraging and rooting around kind of who is taking these berries and are they taking them with them? Are they leaving them there? Those are the kind of questions that we're asking as we sort through the videos. So the videos are 15 seconds long. I have several undergraduate students that are helping me sort through all of my data to kind of give you an idea. I go to these sites every three weeks and I replace the batteries and the SD cards. So the SD cards have 32 gigabytes on each of them. So I have 10 cameras per site and I'm changing them every three weeks. So we have hundreds of gigs of data that I'm trying to sort through. These pictures show you if I wasn't able to place a camera in the tree itself, I could either have the tree camera on a tree adjacent to my female tree or I could have it on the ground pointed at a focal branch that I'm interested in. But these are some of the ways that we've had to position the cameras to get them to show us exactly what we want them to. So far, my undergraduates and I have been able to sort through camera data from October until November at one of the sites, Kamama. And so, so far, we've noticed 22 foraging events of white-tailed deer. Uh, and then we've also seen eastern gray squirrel, the Virginia opossum, differing mice and vole species, the northern cardinal, and the northern flicker. These are some of the organisms that we capture on the camera. So on the left, it's taken from a ground camera and this is actually a Virginia opossum. So these cameras can be really difficult to work with because the animals aren't posing for you. You typically either only see the snout of the animal as they come into the view, or you see the tail as they are quickly trying to move out of the way. So we were able to identify this animal based on the tail. You can see the banding there, but we're not always able to rely on colors to help with identification. But in this picture, you can see the gray squirrel really, really well. Um, you're able to identify him very easily. So we get kind of a whole range of different qualities of pictures and video. These are some of my favorite photos we've taken of a white-tailed deer. You can see just kind of passing by. And then this is a northern flicker, which is a ground foraging bird. And so this flicker is looking for different things to eat in the ground here. This is one of my absolute favorite videos that we've found so far. So this was taken on November 24th at one of our field sites on one of our ground cameras. So you can see him kind of rooting around, and we know based on the ear shape and then the tail shape that you'll see in a second that this is a gray fox. 
Like I said, my project is still kind of new and we're trying to figure out what we want to start for the fall field semester. So some things that we're thinking about looking at or hoping to look at are the viability of the cones. So that just means um, having the ability to germinate. So I've collected berries from each of my sites throughout the year. So we have them in the freezer and we're hoping to plant them and see if they're still able to germinate. I've also wanted to look at the distribution of cones. So when you go into the field and you look at a tree such as this picture on the bottom, um, how the seeds are distributed on the tree specifically. So are birds going to feed off of the top of the tree or the crown or are they going to feed along the base first? Those are all interesting questions. I want to look at population mapping like we talked about in the previous slide. I want to look at removal rate, so how fast the seeds are removed, which addresses my second hypothesis, and then dispersal distance for my third hypothesis. Something else we also want to look at are actually analyzing the nutrients of the seeds, so looking at the carbohydrates, looking at lipid values, different amino acids, things that are really essential for these organisms, so how much energy are they actually able to get out of these berries once they consume them. I'm really thankful to everyone that has helped me in my project so far. It's been a really great experience. Thank you for listening to my talk on the Eastern Red Cedar and seed dispersal. I'm really excited to get to talk with some of you on Thursday. So thank you so much for listening.